Sister Lucia of Fatima once said that God wanted, quote, the consecration of Russia and only Russia without any addition, unquote. Please allow me to repeat those words because they are words of truth from heaven that we might always want to keep in mind. God wants the consecration of Russia and Russia alone without any addition. Dear listeners, hello and welcome. I'm Mariana Bartold, the guest host of Signs and Secrets, featured by the Fatima Center. I'm the author of Fatima, the Signs and Secrets, Guadalupe, Secrets of the Image, and the host of my own modest channel, Genesis 315. Thanks to the generosity of the Fatima Center, you will find in the description box various links to my works and my channel. Now, as you may know, in the last few videos, I've been presenting the fruits of my research with a special series and basically proofs of the consecration was never done. Those will be seen in episode eight and nine of Signs and Secrets in the event that you miss them. Now, due to recent developments I'm making in this episode a detour of sorts, but the destination remains the same. Be assured that in the next video or two, I will continue with my collegial consecration chronology. But first, I will be discussing some questions that have arisen, uh, and I will also be discussing a recent development with Pope Francis. I will begin by first repeating the Virgin's June 13th, 1929 command, wherein she said to Sister Lucia, the moment has come in which God asks the Holy Father, in union with all of the bishops of the world, to make the consecration of Russia to my immaculate heart, promising to save it by this means. For almost 80 years now, that is from October 1942 uh, until last March of 2022, different popes have made at least 14 different consecrations or acts of entrustment. Despite all of those acts, the Fatima prophecies of the second secret have come to pass, including the martyrdom of the good, which continues to this day. Although we have thankfully not seen the warning of the annihilation of various nations come to pass and which Our Lady warned us of in that secret. Anyone who pays attention to current events knows that the prophecy remains a tragic possibility and probability. Daily news reports alone should convince all aware Catholics that to avoid that fulfillment or realization of the third secret vision, because the Vatican has still not seen fit to publicly release in its entirety the third secret message, the Holy Father must obey the Mother of God because she has directed him to command the world's bishops to join him on the same day. Together, or in other words, collegially, they must consecrate Russia and Russia alone to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, as I've already said, there have been since 1942 at least 14 papal acts of consecration or entrustment. However, there are at a minimum three issues with every one of those acts. Number one, in no consecration was Russia and Russia alone the sole object of consecration. There were not to be any additions. And of course, if there are not to be any additions, there can't be any other changes either. Therefore, no consecration to date has fulfilled Our Lady's simple but explicit command. Number two, with the exception of two popes who merely invited the, the world's bishops to join them in the consecrations that they performed, the number of bishops who did accept the invitation in no way numbered the entire college of bishops. And number three, there is another heavenly command which has never been fulfilled, and it is this. Along with the proper collegial consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart, there must also be the public papal promulgation of the five first Saturdays of reparation. Let us reflect that the angelic doctor St. Thomas Aquinas wrote that against a fact there is no argument. Therefore, on the topic of the consecration commanded by heaven, in which I have already proved was commanded by our Lord himself, it is truly a case of objectively 
examining the facts. The emphasis is on the word objectively. Once that work is thoroughly and thoughtfully studied, the objective researcher will conclude the Virgin's explicit and straightforward command has never been obeyed. That said, we know there are always people in the church who, for whatever may be their reasons or agendas, refuse to accept the evident facts of the commanded consecration. Some consider another Catholic's insistence of charity and obedience to the Virgin's commands as proof of a legalist mentality. In truth, there's nothing wrong and there's everything right in being a legalist. Of course, when such people make that claim against what they also call Fatimus, it's meant to be derogatory. However, the term legalist is defined as an advocate or adherent of moral legalism, one that views things from a legal standpoint, and especially <clears throat> one that places primary emphasis on legal principles or on the formal structure of governmental institutions. Now, in the case of Catholicism, the formal structure is one of a hierarchical institution. Frankly, yet unbelievably, progressivists could go so far as to consider the Lord God as a legalist. For a first example, he gave us the Decalogue, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. For each and every commandment, the Church provides the depths of that said commandment so that we must uh, we who, who do follow those Ten Commandments will both better understand how we are to know, love, and serve God, and how to avoid sin or the near occasion of sin. A second example. Through God's church, we are given precepts. But again, there are always individuals or groups who consider themselves to be members of the church, but who curiously view adhering to those moral precepts, those theological precepts, however you want to describe them with an adjective, as blindly submitting to a form of legalism. Now there's a few final examples. Our sacred history, which tells us of the fall of Adam and Eve, who ate of the fruit from a tree which God forbade them, could be considered a case of God's legalism. And then, of course, there are the church's dogmas, doctrines, articles of faith, and canon law which in the mind of progressivists, otherwise known as modernists, or even those who might consider themselves conservatives and even some traditionalists, are merely further examples of a lamentable legalism. As you've already seen, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, with that said, I will move on to last year's consecration and, in relation to it, a recent development. As you may know, a little over a year ago, there was a quick succession of events, starting with the invasion of one country into another, then with the March 2nd request of Ukraine's Latin Rite Catholic bishops to Pope Francis, asking him to consecrate Russia, well actually they said Ukraine and Russia, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. On March 15th, it was announced that Pope Francis would do so, that is that he would consecrate Ukraine and Russia. Days later, it was announced that he would invite the Catholic bishops of the world to join him. Now, while it's true that many bishops did accept that invitation, there were also those who were quite say, ingenious in pretending to acquiesce by either declaring they would offer a private prayer or appointed a lesser person to make the act and other different ways of finding a legal loophole which really wasn't a legal loophole, it was just a loophole. It soon became known that political pressure came to bear on Francis, insisting that he should not make the object of the consecration Eurocentric, so that changes were again made, and almost at the last moment, the final text of the consecration was made public. The pertinent words from that March 25th, 2022 consecration were these. Mother of God and our Mother, to your Immaculate Heart, we solemnly entrust and consecrate ourselves, the Church, and all humanity, especially Russia and Ukraine. So as you can see, there were at least three additions, ourselves, the Church, and all humanity. And then they said, of course, especially Russia and Ukraine. 
Now this was said again March 25th, pronounced in, as the act of consecration after the Pope led a Lenten penance service in St. Peter's Basilica. And then he also said, to you, meaning the Immaculate Heart, we consecrate the future of the whole human family, the needs and expectations of every people, and the anxieties and hopes of the world. More additions. Now fast forward to this year, when, during his Wednesday address of March the 22nd, 2023, Francis referred to last year's consecration, and then he added, quote, let us not tire of entrusting the cause of peace to the Queen of Peace. Therefore, I would like to invite each believer and community, especially prayer groups, to renew every March 25th the act of consecration to Our Lady, so that she, who is Mother, may guard us all in unity and peace." Unquote. The Fatima Center was asked for a comment on this announcement, and it gave the basic succinct response that while there might be some benefits from this consecration, just as with other incomplete consecrations, it still does not fulfill the command of Our Lady for the collegial consecration of Russia, and I will add Russia alone, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, since the Fatima Center also invited my commentary regarding the Pope's remarks, I will highlight at least a few vital points. And as I mentioned earlier, and if I may remind you, I would also ask you to consider hearing the historical proofs, which in episodes eight and nine of Signs and Secrets, I've already demonstrated. Now, to continue with Francis's invitation to each believer, community, especially prayer groups, to renew the March 25th consecration of ourselves, the Church, and all humanity, especially Russia and Ukraine. First, while individuals may consecrate themselves or their children to the Sacred and Immaculate Hearts, the Virgin's command for the consecration of Russia to her Immaculate Heart is directed to the Pope, the Vicar of Christ, steward of the Catholic City. Now, in obedience to the Mother and Queen of the Church, the Pope, in turn, is to command the world's Catholic bishops, in union with Rome, to join him on the same day in a collegial act, again, of Russia, and Russia alone, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now, faith and reason teach us that no person or group can usurp or be granted to the, the privileges which belong solely to the office of the papacy or to the offices of the bishops each individual office for each individual bishop. Nobody can replace those offices, especially lay people. One of the most important reasons that the Virgin Mary made this direct command to the Holy Father was to remind him, the church militant, and yes, eventually, even the, the entire world, of the defining charism of the papal office, a truth which became dimmer and dimmer, and which so many of the popes especially in the last 60 years, either forgot or dismissed or never fully understood. One incident which exposed this terrible misunderstanding or flaw was witnessed in 1980 when John Paul II was approached by Bishop Pavel Hanilka of Czechoslovakia. He told John Paul II in the presence of the Pope's very close friend, Cardinal Wazinski, that the most important thing he had to do during his pontificate was the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary in union with all the bishops. However, John Paul II protested, and eventually he stated that the, quote, jurisdiction of the Pope only comprises the Catholic Church, and he said that the Pope was not the Pope of all men, unquote. It was then that his close friend, again, Cardinal Wazinski, reminded him, quote, Christ being the king of the world, his vicar has jurisdiction over all men, unquote. And in this he was correct. Divine revelation proves that Christ founded the church and the papal office. The purpose of the papal office is to guard the deposit of faith and to teach, govern, and sanctify the people. Now, that's also true in a great degree for the bishops, who are princes of the church in their own right, but they are also subject to the Pope. Therefore, no believer, as the Pope identified people, presumably meaning practicing Catholics, no church community, and no prayer group possesses from heaven the obligation, the right, 
or the authority to make or renew a consecration that can only be made according to heaven's command by the Pope and the body of bishops. Second, I will again repeat what both Our Lord and Our Lady made clear to Sister Lucia. God wants the consecration of Russia and only Russia without any addition. Third, in May of 1952, Our Lady appeared to Sister Lucia saying, quote, make it known to the Holy Father that I am always awaiting the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart. Without the consecration, Russia will not be able to convert, nor will the world have peace." Unquote. There are many more proofs, which again, I will in a future episode or two make evident. But meanwhile, I will conclude by addressing a few more questions or objections related to the commands of Our Lady of Fatima or to Fatima itself. Now, one misunderstanding often repeated is that Either Our Lord or Our Lady said the consecration will be made, quote, too late, unquote. Now, as I've already proven in episode eight, that was never said. There's a misunderstanding there due to translation. But Our Lord also said other things to make that clear. For example, he did say the consecration would be late and that Russia will have already spread her errors throughout the world. But neither he nor Our Lady ever said the consecration would be too late. In fact, our Lord in speaking to Lucia said, it will never be too late to have recourse to Jesus and Mary, which you will also hear in one of my past episodes. Now, on a related note, there have even been some priests who misunderstood that and were gently and very respectfully provided the evidence to the opposite because people became aware of my chronology. And why is that important? Because these are directions from God himself. These are not things that I'm simply making up. Then there are a, another fault. Well, there is another false claim that we need not really concern ourselves with either Our Lady's commands or just Fatima itself because Fatima is a private revelation. Therefore, its message or any interpretations of it by anybody are non-binding on the faithful. First of all, it has to be said, and I'm really sorry I have to say it, but that is an attitude that is a false view, and that interpretation is non-binding. Why? Because it's superfluous, and it's a rather dismissive attitude toward the Virgin Mother of God and toward the Church, which investigated the Fatima apparitions and declared them in October of 1930 as worthy of belief. It's impossible to accept that any Catholic would so airily dismiss or ignore the Virgin's prophecies in the Great Secret given on July 13, 1917, including the prophecy that was immediately made known at the time uh, at Fatima that the Lady promised in October she would give a sign so that all may see and believe. That prophecy was fulfilled with the great miracle of the sun at solar noon, on October the 13th, 1917, in Fatima, and as, as time has passed, one by one, the Fatima prophecies continue to unfold. And some of them, as you already know, are very dire. They're, they're catastrophic. But again, we, these are conditional prophecies depending on the entire church militant's response to those requests. <clears throat> in that regard, we lay people as well as priests and bishops cannot renew a consecration of Russia, which has to be done by the Pope and all the world's bishops. But we can pray the rosary. We can make the five for Saturday's devotions. We can wear the brown scapular. We can offer up our daily duty as our own penance. We can offer up all of the things in our lives uh, in reparation to God and for the conversion of sinners. Now, we know that divine revelation ended with the death of the last surviving apostle, St. John the Evangelist. There's no argument there. I'm bringing that up in connotation to the false claim that we really don't have to pay attention to private revelations. But neither true prophecy nor true miracles from God ended with the apocalypse. As St. Paul inerrantly taught in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 through 21, quote, do not extinguish the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test all things and hold fast to that which is good, unquote. And as I've said a million times, including in my Fatima book, God, the church did test Fatima 
and did test that these prophecies were true. And so we should hold fast to that which is good and do all that Our Lady so motherly and gently asked us, but it really commands. Let us also remember that the Lord God promised that he will be with us until the consummation of the world. He does so not only by his true presence in the Blessed Sacrament, but also when he sends to his humble servants the Immaculate One, the Virgin Mary, or an angel from heaven, with a message from him. The reason is best taught by the angelic doctor, again, St. Thomas Aquinas, in the Summa Theologica, in which he wrote, quote, In all ages, men have been divinely instructed in matters expedient for the salvation of the elect. And in all ages, there have been persons possessed of the spirit of prophecy, not for the purpose of announcing new doctrines, but to direct human actions. Unquote. And such were the reasons for the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima. Now, in the next episode, I will again continue with my Fatima chronology. And so, until the next time, may God bless you and may Our Lady Mary keep you and yours under her starry mantle. Salve, Regina.